Hello, Business 630 students, Corporate Finance. This is Professor Hassey. It's week eight, our last week of Corporate Finance for this spring one session, March 21st to 27th. Your graded work this week is to complete and wrap up the Electrics Incorporated case. Uh, for any of you who are struggling with that a little bit, please feel free to review the review session video of Saturday, March 19th. It was It's about one hour in length. It should help you uh, uh, answer some of your questions. And if those are not answered by that video, uh, please feel free to contact me this week. I am available uh, throughout the week. Uh, remember, we have uh, office hours, student hours on Thursday evening. That might be a good time to uh, finish your work and do one final review with me. There'll be no uh, video lecture for Thursday, but I will be online available for any questions you might have to wrap up your electrics case, which will conclude our course grade-wise. Uh, and the course evaluation, uh, uh, the link is now posted in Blackboard in a variety of locations. Uh, if you need a link to, to wrap, uh, to do your course evaluation, and then all the grades will be posted uh, by Wednesday of next week, March 30th. Um, so um, please plan on that over the next coming days. Um, <clears throat> also this week, we're going to be posting grades uh, for, uh, for case number four, the PowerPoint presentation of your company's financial statement review. Uh, those grades will be posted by Thursday, March 24th, just so you have a good idea heading into the last weekend of our course uh, where you stand grade-wise. And again, uh, please review your grade. Please review your cumulative average up to this point in the class uh, so you understand it. If you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. I'll be happy to help you or answer any questions you might have about your grade. Our last topic uh, in the course is alternative capital strategies, kind of along the same vein that we were talking about last week in week seven, where companies have the option of merging or acquiring to get capital. Uh, this week, uh, another way of obtaining capital is to rent, to lease, to not purchase, to just rent and pay a lease or rental fee on an asset. This is very, very popular with companies who do not have access or the ability to access lots of capital. And that is basically small business. You and I know a lot about leasing. If we cannot afford a house, what do we do to live? We lease or rent an apartment or a home. If we can't afford uh, transportation to purchase, or we lease or rent a car. We're having access to an asset, a home, an apartment, automobile without taking on debt or a payment situation as far as paying back principal with interest. We still have to pay for the asset, but it's in the form of a lease. There's a variety of different types of leases. There's operating leases, financial leases. The, we're going to take a look at a, a um, problem that shows you the net advantage to leasing, the, the sole determination, like anything else in our class, has been the determination of the present value of an asset. Well, you can do a present value analysis to determine whether you should lease or purchase an asset. I used to do this quite often when I decided in my business, should I go out and purchase a new telephone system? Should I go out and purchase a new computer? Should I go out and purchase a new copier? Or would it be more strategically sound to rent that computer, rent that uh, telephone system instead of paying for it? We'll talk about that uh, in this week's course. But before we do that, let me just go through uh, a couple of points from those articles we started discussing last week in week number seven. I want to talk about a couple of points of those which will kind of carry forward into this week, this week's thinking, and also this week's final thinking and thoughts and interpreting your electrics case paper. So let's take a look at those right now. First article I want to discuss is the balance scorecard that measures performance. For a lot of our training in business and finance, accounting and management, we use the SWOT analysis. But there's another analysis that's becoming quite popular these days in business, and it's called the balance scorecard. 
The balanced scorecard allows managers to look at business from four important perspectives. And those perspectives are talked about in the article. From the financial perspective, from the internal business perspective, from the innovation and learning perspective, and from the customer perspective. What are the goals and measurements of each one of those specific performance measurements of how you look at a business? And this is, this is taking a look at a little bit more detail and a little bit more specific measurement of a company's performance. And I find it very useful, especially for people who wanna be entrepreneurs or um, uh, individuals who wanna have their own business. It gives you a better perspective of or measuring your business and whether you're doing it correctly, especially measuring your business when you're doing it correctly for your investors, be it banks, be it uh, family, be it uh, hedge funds, be it uh, all different types of capital fundraising vehicles for entrepreneurs, and are you representing their interests? I think this balanced scorecard has been mentioned a few times when I watched the Shark Tank show when the uh, investors look at a balanced scorecard and looking at <coughs> excuse me the performance of a protect of a prospective business that's being brought onto the show so the balanced scorecard is just another way of measuring performance <coughs> excuse me i'm sorry what what do the financial measurements do a lot like what you did in case number 4 what do the financial measurements of a company tell us about our goals, what we're trying to do in our company. Naturally, the most obvious one is making a profit, <coughs> making a, uh, having a good uh, debt position, having a manageable, efficient asset base, financial perspective. Then the internal business perspective. What are, are we efficient? You know, a lot of companies, uh, you might, a lot, many of you might've heard of this Six Sigma, where it's a way of performance measurement, efficiency analysis, becoming very efficient in your management techniques and your production techniques, Six Sigma. It's a way of determining quality assurance in a company. What, how do we excel in our business? What is, what is a measurement of our company doing well? Financial, yes, but other measures. Do we have employee loyalty? Do we have a good, good relationship with our vendors? Do we have a good relationship with our community? These internal business perspectives are very important to measure the soundness of a company. Bad choice of words there, but I think you get my drift. Then there, there's the innovation and learning perspective. Are we designing management strategies, financial strategies to get better, to become more efficient, to be innovative, to be state of the art for lack of a better word. Are we competitive in our industry and in our marketplace because we're setting the standards for that industry and marketplace? For some industries, this is more important than others. Technology companies, engineering companies, construction companies, are we innovative? But also, is it, it's important for all types of businesses. In education, are we providing innovation in our teaching techniques? Online, hybrid, better ways of teaching in these platforms. So innovation and learning perspectives is very important for a company as a balanced scorecard measurement. And finally, perhaps the most important for many industries is how do customers perceive us? What's the customer perspective? I'm sure a lot of you every now and then in emails or you get uh, things in uh, telephone calls about uh, polls and asking uh, surveys and asking you for your uh, view on our, of our product, of your experience with our company. I know if you use Amazon quite a bit, you get measurement indicators and surveys from Amazon. It's, it's looking at customer perspective constantly judging, reviewing, surveying your customer. Are they happy? Are they pleased? Do they want more? And a lot of times you gotta, you gotta watch out for this because sometimes customers don't really pay much attention with surveys and feedback and they kind of give you what you, they think you wanna hear. So that's a, that's, a, that's a science to understand what your customers want. 
It's kind of like managing a family and managing your, if you have children, you know, you have to be stern, disciplined, you want them to do well, but at the same time, you want to give them space so they can grow, think on their own. What's that proper balance in managing your family? But also, what's the proper balance in understanding your customer base? Do you constantly survey them and ask them what's going on, or do you randomly select customers who maybe you who use your products quite often? Demographic surveys. So again, as you can see by this balanced scorecard performance, performance measurement, we're looking at different things, financial, efficiency, innovation, client, customers. And it's a great way of take, getting another perspective on an analysis of a measurement. You could almost take a look at this in, in some respect, but not using all these four measures in the electrics case. What is this product? What is this financially going to do? What's the has the best return? But also, is it going to make your company better, producing a more an interesting product that your customers will get into and latch onto? It's another way of looking at a strategy. And finally, speaking of strategies, how about strategies without disrupting your organization? Another great article that might be able to help you down the line in your own career. A management system can be defined as a set of processes and practices used to align and control an organization. Management systems include procedures for planning strategy and operations, for setting capital and operating budgets, for measuring and rewarding performance, and for reporting progress and conducting meetings. Boy, in one line, there's business management. Strategy, capital requirements, measurement, future, reporting. It is fair to say that historically, most companies have relied entirely on financial systems, usually centered on the budget for these various processes and practices. But relying on the budget as a primary management system ca cause short-term financial considerations to overwhelm longer-term strategic goals. And boy, I can, I can speak to that from my own personal experience. You're so obsessed with breaking even and making a profit this month, you forget about the big picture of where your company is going to be in a year or two years. In the 1980s and 90s, many companies introduced total quality management as a new management system. But why total quality management enabled firms to focus more effectively on process improvements, the ability to implement strategic or strategy across organizational units remained elusive. Companies' management systems were still tactical and operational, not strategic. Using the balanced scorecard approach is a good way of reviewing your systems but is it strategic? Is it really helping your company? So that's the article goes about how management systems correlate to when you have to change, when you have to adapt, and who gets affected by that. People lose their jobs. People get new bosses that you're not happy with. People have to change job locations. All these strategic goals of the balanced fr framework right? Financial, customer, process, innovation. Are these all good strategic terms that provide a good strategic approach? And how does it change your company to the better? So if you operate this way, change can be cultural and people don't get freaked out by change, get freaked out by a new strategy, get freaked out by a new boss. It's called strategy without disrupting your organization. And this can be a very good strategy for companies that are constantly due to the industry they're in and the market they're in that have to constantly innovate and change to adapt to the industry and to the market. And a lot, the reason why these, these two articles are especially good today and March of 2022 is because so many companies are strange changing their management strategies because of the pandemic, because of technology, 
because of globalization, because of social and environmental reasons. And a lot of companies are kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, excuse the expression, because they don't know, they kind of want to go back to their old ways of doing things, but then they want to think about, well, no, no, we got to think about the future. We got to think about getting up to date. We got to think about change. Well, that affects companies internally. Constant strategizing and changing and thinking things out can be very difficult on your staff, on your employees and how to develop this culture where it doesn't disrupt your organization by procedures and strategic guidelines and balanced scorecard and understanding social and psychological effects that it has on, a, on your employee base. These are key things in 2022 to developing a sound business and a sound management strategy. And it all again correlates in this course. You first of all, find out where you stand risk-wise, financial-wise, where your money comes from, your capital, where you invest that capital. What's the performance measurement of that capital once it's invested? And how does it affect your customers, your internal resources, your status in the community? This is corporate finance, and it's a good way to end the course. Because corporate finance, like, like everything else in business, the bottom line is to win, to make money. But so much in 2022, the bottom line, in addition to making money and winning, is providing safety, security for your workforce. Providing security and safety for the community you live in, sustainability environmental aspects, social aspects, giving back to the community. These are very difficult times to be in business because of the pressures of all these things placed on companies. And as an MBA student, you're going to be a leader in developing these strategies and a leader in leading companies and people within those companies without disrupting them without changing them too much, but in an environment that warrants change, that gets your employee base engaged and everybody on the same page. And I think that's the key to corporate finance and a corporate financial manager is to be able to think that way and understand, okay, I understand the numbers. I understand what they tell me, but how do I correlate that understanding of financials to people, customers, community. That's a key to being a good leader in business these days. Okay, two good articles, and I hang on to those. They're good to read every now and then. Every now and then when I've had a bad day teaching, which I don't usually do, but I do say every now and then I have a bad day teaching or you have a bad day and you think, did I do something wrong today? It just didn't feel right talking to people, communicating, coming up with ideas. I go back and read key articles like these to refresh myself, to make sure everything's okay. That I know what I'm, I know what I'm doing. I just maybe just had an off day. This is a good thing as you get out of college and you move on with your career and education, no more dopey papers for Professor Hassey or figuring out spreadsheets. But when you're out there thinking and correlating these spreadsheets and these strategies to leading people, every now and then you're going to have a bad day. And that's where these articles and this, the past of education can help you manage through that. I hope you think about that in the future. Okay, one last thing, leasing. I'm in Blackboard in week number eight. And the reason why I, you know, I'm bringing this up, lease financing, because it's especially for small business individuals, leasing is the major way of getting assets to create products and services. Well, a lot of us can't afford to pay $1 million for some capital assets or buy a new uh, three or four new computers. We have to lease 
And that's why, even though you're not being tested on any of this, not being assessed on anything, anything of this, uh, it's a good base for understanding, well, okay, the whole class, we're talking about buying assets, managing assets, financial perspective of assets. But what about the little guy who has to only lease? Prior to the 1950s, leasing was generally associated with real estate. Today, however, it is possible to lease virtually any kind of fixed asset. And currently over 30% of all new capital equipment is financed through lease arrangements. Don't worry, but the problem we look at is you don't have to do the problem. I'm gonna show you this example of this problem about the calculation of lease versus buy. The key analysis to leasing is the net advantage to leasing a discounted cash flow analysis of lease cash flow disbursements versus buy disbursements. What's the cheaper one, leasing or buying? Here's a little video explaining that. And here's, that, here's the spreadsheet if you wanna use it as an example later on. I've found that a lot of students use this as they go on in their career or all in their own personal financial life. Should is it getting to the point in time where I should be purchasing assets instead of leasing them? When does that be prudent? Well, here's a spreadsheet that talks about this. Again, you don't have to do anything involving this course as far as assessment with this spreadsheet or anything like that. So don't anybody panic, but again, uh, as MBA students now finishing up your MBA studies, you'll be taking a lot of this material, taking a lot of these topics from all your classes into the real world. And this is another one of those real world applications that you can think of. It's what should I purchase, in this case, a $1.5 million asset, or should I lease it and just make lease payments? Lease payments coming out of my operating budget as a lease expense or a rent expense. The main difference between leasing and buying is, is when you own something, you get tax deductions. You get a tax deduction for the interest you pay on the loan you, you helped you acquire that asset. You get tax deductions on the depreciation that you can expense, non-cash expenses that you can expense for that asset. Those are key to tax deductions that you can get by ownership. That's why most people say own, 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 because you get tax advantages. But if you can't afford the money to get that purchase or you don't have sufficient credit to get a good loan, you lease. And still lease has one form of, of tax advantage. It's an operating expense. It's a business expense. So naturally it reduces your, li your tax liability because it reduces the income taxable income that you get off that asset that's you are whatever you're leasing. So you do get some tax advantage as being an operating business expense. So here in this purchase of this $1.5 million, I'm going to assume that this is a non-amortized lease. In other words, you're borrowing $1.5 million and it's due in four years. You have to pay the bank back in four years. Prior to that, you just make interest payments. The interest rate is 15%, ouch. So you're borrowing money, you don't have to pay it back for four years, you have to pay interest and you get a depreciation schedule. And according to this asset, you guys are familiar with this from the um, electrics case, they have a marginal accelerated cost recovery depreciation schedule where over four years, you're depreciating 33, 45, 15 and 7% in, uh, depreciation of the fixed asset over the course of that time. Thus, you're generating a tax saving based on your tax rate of 40%. So in other words, during the course of the four-year life, I'm generating positive cash flows for the first two years of owning this asset because I'm getting tax advantages from the interest and the depreciation. Then it starts switching naturally, especially in year four, when I have to actually pay the loan back, the $1.5 million. Also, I can dispose of the asset at the end of its life with a scrap value of 250,000, have to pay a tax on that gain since I fully depreciated. So 
net effect I'm generating over the course of time, a present value of $885,581 of cash out for the purchase of this $1.5 million asset. I'm gaining cash from the tax advantages, from selling it off, but also I'm spending a lot of money on interest and the principal. And with a interest rate of 9% present value, which is determined by my interest rate on my loan of 15% times one minus the tax rate of 40%. So that's 9% is my net, ca uh, ta um, net cost of capital. So if I discount these cash flows of going in and out, my cash flow is present value 885,000. But if I look at the lease of that asset, it's costing me $400,000 a year in lease payments. So I'm paying $1.6 million over four years to lease a $1.5 million asset. That's not a bad deal. But naturally, that $400,000 lease is a business expense, which you get a tax break. So I take out the tax of that amount, which is 1 minus T, 60% of that. So there's my net after tax expenditures for the lease. I take those series of cash flows and discount them back at the 9% cost of capital. And if you notice, the lease payments are cheaper present value than the purchasing platform. I'm saving about well, a little bit over $100,000 by leasing this asset. Now, why in this case is this better? Well, usually works out the shorter the term of the life of the asset and the financing of that, that asset, it's cheaper to lease. The longer it goes out, the longer the life of the asset, different asset classes like buildings, major equipment, the longer the asset, it's probably cheaper to purchase that asset. But for shorter term assets, definitely the advantage is for leasing. That's why approximately three quarters of all businesses rent or lease their computers. They rent or lease their copy machines. They have a shorter life. It's cheaper to lease than to buy them. Because if you buy them, you're gonna probably buy new ones every two or three years because you beat the hell out of them. Now you, and the technology changes. So you need a new computer or copier. It's cheaper to lease. But if you're gonna buy a building or rent a building, if you're gonna buy a major piece of equipment, it's cheaper to purchase that asset if you can afford and your credit is good, the loan. So these are different alternatives of financing, lease versus buy. And you can do a cash flow analysis, very similar to this one, to determine what is cheaper. So I wanted to show you this because this you can use this. You can use it in business, you can use it in personal finance, a, a variety of ways of funding. A lot of people, once they get, you know, once you get to a certain income level, if you have any accountants or financial advisors, everybody's telling you, okay, you got to start owning assets because you need that tax break and you need to generate additional revenue because you can now afford to own assets. When does that happen for you? At what point in time does a company or personal finance management say, you know, I got to start, maybe I need to buy a rental property. Maybe I need to buy a vacation home or a retirement home. Now's the time to do that because now I need and can afford the purchase of it via loan financing. And also I need the tax deduction. Many times you see people who make three, $400,000 a year and own no assets. They just rent a home or an apartment. They're, they're losing out about 10 to 15 to 20% of their income because of the higher tax bracket they're in because they have no deductions on those assets they own. At that point in time, that's when you have to start thinking about owning assets. And usually the income level for an individual is about $250,000. Once you get to that point, that's when it's now time to start owning. For companies, it's usually about 10 to $15 million in sales a year. Again, it depends on the industry. 
But that's the usual point. When a company manager has got to start thinking, you know, we got to start owning our assets. Our credit's better. We're generating more sales, probably more cash flow. Now's the time to start owning instead of leasing. These alternative capital strategies are very important to know down the road in corporate management. So that's our lecture today. Let me just bring this up. That's our week eight lecture. Going over those two articles, which I think are excellent, not so much for now, the present in corporate finance class, this business 630 class, but down the road to help your career, help management, help you get a perspective of measuring and changing an organization or even yourself. And then an, another strategy of capital, of getting capital is leasing. And the exercise of discounted cash flow analysis that go into that analysis and decision making. As you can see on the screen, I, screen, I have posted the evaluation link, link for our business 630 uh, CRN 1659 class. You can click on that link or go to the email that was sent to you by the university and finish our evaluation. Again, as I've said before, this helps me. It helps the university assess the value of our classes, of our formats, of our platforms, and are you satisfied for what you're getting? So please, if you can, fill those out. Again, you're work, we're working on electrics this week. We'll have a review session, student hours on Thursday. If you need other times and information, please feel free to get a hold of me. I will have a adios video for our class on Friday of this week for the weekend as we wrap up the course and get ready to move on. One of the great things that I enjoy about University of Laverne is even though this course is ending this week, I still have developed a network with you all. Yes, we haven't been in a classroom, we've been online, but through my videos and through these dopey Zoom things, I feel like maybe I've developed a little a network for you where down the road, you can ask me for letters of recommendation, advice, opinion. Where should I go for information? And you can include me as a source of that in that network. And that's why we end on a positive note in this class. And also LinkedIn, other media types, you can connect with me as we develop a post-student faculty member relationship, you are a colleague of mine as soon as you finish this program. You're not a student, you're a colleague. And I hope you treat me as with such down the future if you need any information or help. So with that being said, let's uh, wrap up our electrics case this week. Might see some of you on Thursday evening, and I'll look forward to one last video of this coming end of the week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Be well. Adios.